Hollywood versus reality. He took us up to 60,000 feet. What are you doing? Coming up. Hey 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel 74 Gear is all about aviation. Now I got sent this video by a few different people. They said it's just the opening part of the movie that needs to get reviewed. That's the only aviation related part of the movie. But if you have a movie that you wanna see in this Hollywood versus reality series, the two easiest places to send them to me, my Instagram or the free form 74gear.com. Let's get into it. Hope you've enjoyed your 18 minute flight from South Bend. We'll be touching down at Chicago's Midway very shortly. We'd like to thank you for flying with us today because at Econo Air, we're working hard to win back your trust. Harry, you mind taking over while I hit the lab? Sure thing, Rusty. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, and Rusty, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for going to bat for me last week. I was happy to do it. You know, just because corporate says you're too old to fly doesn't make it true. If anything, you're more qualified than us younger guys. It means a lot to me. Sure thing. The first obvious thing that most of you already know is in the US, you're never gonna see a pilot leave where there's not a second person up there on the flight deck. Now there's a security reason for that, and there's also a reason for the fact that this guy looks like he's on his final approach for life. And even though some pilots are childish when we're at work, we still have protocol to follow. And one of those protocols is before you ever leave the flight deck, you look through that peephole that you see there. This peephole here is actually one way, so we can see out, but people really can't see in and see what's going on. It's very similar to what a lot of you have in your house that allows for security, for the pilots to be able to see out, make sure the area is clear, that there's no bad guys or something that looks suspicious there. Some planes have cameras, some have cameras and peepholes, but you're always gonna look at that peephole before you go out there. Here's the problem. This peephole is set at waist level, which is not practical, but would really make for some great pranks that would probably get you fired if it were two-way glass. But it's not that low. It's usually probably, I guess, about maybe somewhere about 5'8", because I usually have to bend down in order to see out the people. But it does make me wonder, if you're a pilot and you're 5'2", how are you able to look up and see out the people? The next thing that caught my attention is something that pilots have, at least I have this, is that I'm easily distracted by certain things. If if you watch some of the outtakes of these videos that get edited out, sometimes there'll be a plane flying by and I'll be talking to the camera and I'll see a plane and I'll go, ooh, plane. So we can easily be distracted. And the reason that's relevant is this. Plane manufacturers won't put a bunch of colorful lights in front of us while we're flying, especially these colors like red and yellow. If you put those types of colors up there in front of the pilots at all times, it's gonna make it a lot harder for the manufacturers of the aircraft to get our attention. If there is something that's vital that they need to get our attention on, and red and yellow are up there all the time, you're not going to really see it or notice it as much. So those are the types of colors that are only gonna show up if it's a caution or a warning. So those are two things that you really need to pay attention to. The next thing is, pilots aren't usually gonna leave the flight deck to go to the bathroom on an 18 minute flight. Hope you've enjoyed your 18 minute flight. So this is a little bit nitpicky on this movie, but usually on an 18 minute flight, a pilot is gonna to go to the bathroom before takeoff and go to the bathroom on landing unless they're in a code brown situation. And if you aren't familiar with a code brown situation, I talked about it in a cockpit confessionals a few years back. I'll put a link to it up there. The other thing is, is that pilots typically refer to management. He's calling them corporate. That is true in corporate America. They'll refer to, if you're working at a branch store, the overall management, they'll call them corporate. But in the airlines, when you're talking about it, you usually refer to it as management. There's other words that people use to refer to management at airlines, but management will be the basic phrase that we will use for this video purposes. Dad, is that the pilot? It sure is. He just came from the cockpit. Hey there, little guy. Hi. So your first time on a plane? We were planning on driving, but uh, Tyler here has been begging us to go on his first airplane. Oh, is that right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Do you think I can be a pilot when I grow up? Yeah, oh, I don't see why not. You just have to study hard and listen to your parents. Okay. Sorry about that. A little bit of rough air. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Hey, we call that turbulence, all right? That's when the plane... Oh, so sorry. 
So they do get something right in this scene, and that's if you ever have a kid that does something like this, then rest assured your pilot is going to make this face and walk over with this swagger. Now back in the days before 9-11, it used to be, and I remember it as a kid of the 80s, that the pilots, when they'd get up to cruise, they'd open the door. I remember it super clearly. I was on a flight, they opened up the flight deck door, and they said, any kids want to come up to see the flight deck? And the kids would just like climb over their parents if they weren't in the aisle. I remember sitting in the aisle and just waiting because my dad told me that this was going to happen. I remember just waiting for them to open the door. They opened the door and I just like jumped out and just like bolted up, up the aisle and I was the first kid up there. So I was up there and I was just pestering these pilots with so many questions. I remember that the captain goes, you know, why don't you give one of the other kids a chance to ask some questions because I was just peppering these guys. They were probably just sick of me being up there. But that used to be a thing. But typically you aren't going to have pilots that are going to do this where they get out during the break and then they go talk to the passengers. I, I will do it from time to time when I'm on my break because there's two other pilots up there. But in a situation like where there's two pilots and one takes a break, you really need to be expeditious about going to the bathroom and getting back to work. But in a long haul situation where I might have a three or four hour break, I'll usually get out and go downstairs and talk with the flight attendants in the galley and get snacks and eat and relax and not be on the flight deck. And in that case, sometimes the flight attendants will say, hey, uh, the guy over in 52F, he recognized you, he wants to talk to you, can you go say hi? And I'll go over there and talk with him. But typically speaking, on a two pilot crew like what you're seeing here, the pilots aren't gonna go and, and make small talk just because they have the responsibility to get back up onto the flight deck. But if you ever see me coming over to you to say hi and I'm making a face like this, please tell me to stop. As for the turbulence coming on unknowingly, it's weird because I would say about 90 or 95% of the time, I can feel a second before the turbulence hits. I, there's, it's kind of hard to describe unless you experience the sensation a lot, but it's like if you're flying along, it almost feels like you've gotten onto a wave in the ocean. You feel this, the, the plane kind of shift and lift up a little bit like it's just gotten onto a wave. It's, kind of the only way I can explain it. I, I felt it enough just to know exactly, as soon as I feel that, I know, uh-oh, the turbulence is coming. So to have something like this happen, that is extremely rare. However, just because it happened to be a few days ago, I was on one of these 15-hour flights, which I love to do, and during this flight, I was looking out the window, and we were, I was talking with the other captain, we were looking out the window and just kind of making small talk. We were over the middle of the ocean. There was nothing going on. It was smooth as glass. There was nothing going on. And then for about a half a second, we hit some probably moderate turbulence and it was just so aggressive. And in that half a second, we both were like, oh man. And we both turned and grabbed onto the yoke just in case the autopilot disconnected. We turned around and grabbed them. By the time we grabbed onto both of us did it. By the time we grabbed onto it, it was smooth again. And it's so rare to have something like that, except if you're experiencing some wake turbulence, which we, we wouldn't have experienced in, in this area that we were at, but it was just so strange. And so normally you, I will notice right before we're about to hit turbulence, so you'd be able to grab onto something. But something like this could happen, and that's why the pilots and the flight attendants always say, when you're in your seat, keep your seatbelt fastened because you can't experience turbulence when you're not expecting it. But I'd say about 90, 95% of the time, I can feel the turbulence before it comes. So next time you're on the flight, I know some of you are scared of turbulence. Next time you're on a flight, wait to feel that sensation where the plane feels like it's going onto a wave. That's the only way I can describe it. It feels like it's going onto a wave and then the turbulence is gonna come. And that's just because there's a shifting of the air. So it'll, you'll feel that, that slight movement before the turbulence comes and then you know it's coming. In that way, you never end up in this situation. <laughs> and while I have heard of flight attendants sitting down in an aisle or sitting down on a passenger's lap, so that way they can hold on to the armrest when we experience some unexpected rough turbulence. Obviously it's safer for them to sit down and hold on to something than try to stand there and balance themselves. But I have, I have heard of flight attendants sitting down in somebody's lap and, and holding on to an armrest, which most people are gonna understand. They don't want their, somebody else to get hurt because they don't want someone to be touching them. But I have heard of that. I've never heard of a pilot grabbing someone like this. but I am 100% sure that some of them have tried at some point or another. All right, let's check out this last scene. Perry, you took us up to six 
60,000 feet. What are you doing? Oh, Rusty, I want to thank you for going to bat for me last week. So thankfully for those of us who are pigmentally challenged and have blue eyes and have to squint when it's super bright outside like I'm doing today, planes no longer are made to have all of these windows like you're seeing here on the flight deck. Some planes back in the day, like the old MD-80s or the 737s, used to have something that were called eyebrow windows. These eyebrow windows were basically windows that were used when you were doing long flights and needed navigation with the sextant, which is a really old tool that was used by sailors back in the day, and they used that tool to help figure out their position with using stars as part of the navigation, which I'm very glad that they don't do now. But that's what those windows were for but they don't need those now. They have so many redundant ways to track your aircraft and for you to figure out where you're at in the world that it's unnecessary. So next time you see one of these or one of these here on a 737, you'll know what that was used for, but you're gonna see them less and less. Also, I think it's worth mentioning that on the flight deck, we don't have oxygen masks like the passengers have. These right here are the oxygen masks that the passengers are gonna have in the back of the plane and they produce less oxygen and for a limited time period. And our oxygen masks don't drop from the ceiling like they do for you in the cabin area. They are actually down by our feet. This is a picture of what it looks like on a 747. These here are what we actually use and they're connected to oxygen tanks so we can get 100% pressurized air in case of an emergency. And for this part where he says 60,000 feet. You took us up to 60,000 feet, what are you doing? Your commercial airliners, like what you fly on as a passenger, usually won't ever go above the 40s. The 40s is even high. Usually, as you know, when you're a passenger, the pilots say, oh, we'll be cruising today at 36,000 uh, feet on our way out to San Antonio. So 30s is usually where we're staying at. On a 7.4, we'll go to the 40s just because it's, it's more fuel efficient and we got four engines and so we can do that more often. But typically, you're never going to hear about a commercial airliner going above the 40s. However, if you ever fly private on, let's say, a, a G550, a Gulfstream 550 like this one here, those will cruise up at the 50,000 foot range because their wings and their aircraft is designed to be up at that altitude. It allows them to get over the tops of clouds and have a much smoother ride throughout the day. But if you were to take a commercial airliner, even let's say a 747 up to 60,000 feet, most likely it's going to stall and that's going to mean that the plane is going to nose itself over and head back down to thicker air. Now, if you want to see another Hollywood versus reality, check out this video here. And if you want to see some pilots that are dealing with air traffic control in real life, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.